Um, delighted to be here. The talk's been super interesting. Um, I was able to attend yesterday and sort of reflect a little bit on sort of where I sit. Um, oh no, where with these different communities. Um, so, and I guess I can't see the the chat at the same time. So someone else will watch. Um, but so uh, we're in the setting of you know, talking about what I'm going to call fairness related harms. Um, and so this includes sort of the allocative type examples that we have seen plenty of already and will continue to see in the news, um, as well as the kind of sort of representational harms, um, for instance, when this went viral of the who gets shown in uh, various Twitter um, photo croppings of, you know, sort of what is considered salient in a photo. But regardless of sort of allocative or representative harms, um, I, I want to say that we can sort of often end up talking about sort of biases in machine learning, but really we're most concerned about when these are actually harms of some form and when they are sort of fairness related. And this sort of accounts for the fact that we might have um, different, uh, accounts for the fact that we might have sort of different understandings of what we mean by fairness, which I'll spend plenty of time talking about, um, but sort of really helps us reimagine what we're trying to get at when we're thinking about um, diagnosing or preventing or mitigating these harms. Um, it also brings back sort of power into the situation of sort of what decisions are being made when and where those impacts go and helps us move away from say uh, technical only types of solutions. So uh, we're going to have these kinds of harms. Inequality exists this is going to just sort of show up at some point somewhere, um, always somewhere for someone. Um, one of the things that makes this challenging that has sort of already been discussed to some degree is that we're thinking about both um, these sort of like structural differences as well as sort of individual level harms. And so how we protect against those or how we reason about them or how we sort of detect their presence might be different. Um, but often it's still useful to sort of account for the fact that certain harms exist or the degree to which they exist, um, which can be helpful for getting them uh, intervened upon, sort of proving that they exist, showing the degree of this inequality, um, showing that you know uh, interventions are required. So, um, so we still want to typically measure that. And so, um, you know, sort of signaling of where these harms can be assessed. We have all these sort of different methods heavily drawing from the social sciences here on how we might detect um, uh, fairness related harms in computational systems. Um, and then also, like many of us have spoken today, um, how uh, we might think about countering with interventions um, uh, through different types of mechanisms and also at different levels from the design process of a machine learning model up through sort of large scale legal and regulatory mechanisms. So, so these are sort of how we find them, how we counter them. Um, but I want to make a sort of specific claim uh, about where fairness related harms emerge. And uh, I'd like to spend a little time um, building on some past work and then sort of pointing to some future directions about how fairness related harms emerge when there is a mismatch between the thing we purport to be measuring and the thing we actually do. So um, this is maybe not a controversial thing to say. I would say that this is actually um, important in that it, in, into what it reveals about the kinds of systems we think about. And so uh, I'll define all of these terms more uh, in depth coming next, but just to set this up, in social science world where we have these tools, again, to sort of assess and measure and uh, model interventions on um, fairness related harms, we actually have this really nice process where we have, you know, we might have some hypothesis, we're thinking about some kind of social construct, I'll define these, we operationalize it somehow as, you know, there is something um, that we're using to represent this idea, this sort of squishy underlying um, construct and we believe that this construct affects things in the real world on which we take measurements and so we have sort of um, a long history in the social sciences of trying to assess these harms trying to sort of think about um, measurement of these underlying social constructs and so um, in some ways it's quite 
straightforward then to be thinking about where these fairness related harms might emerge. So yesterday, Reddy had spoke about, um, you know, if you're trying to think about the construct of poverty and you represent that with income, um, you're necessarily going to be missing sort of significant issues about, say, wealth, something that's missing from the operationalization. Maybe by poverty, you actually in the construct mean precarity. And so maybe there are other aspects you want to be bringing in um, within that. So again, sort of within the sort of social science world framework, um, it sort of, it, it really sort of makes clear where sort of fairness related harms might emerge and how we might uh, address them. Uh, however, uh, machine learning world in practice is, is not like that. Um, and that's not to say that we don't have sort of clear pipelines of pre-processing and training data and test data, but it's that the sort of construct operationalization measurement process is just so deeply entangled within all of this. Um, so, and it really sort of means it's, it's much harder than to diagnose or name or label uh, what might be happening um, and where we might see the potential for those harms or even just understand harms that have already happened um, for assumptions that have uh, already happened at various stages along this process. So um, part of why this work we argue is critical is that you know we actually need this language. We need to be able to tease apart these different ideas and we need to be able to um, uncover the existing assumptions in the systems we're concerned about, where we're concerned about various related harms. Um, and fortunately, we do have the sort of the tools, the framework of construct validity as a way to sort of actually generatively sort of poke at what we think is going on in the system um, and where we think these mismatches might be and where these potential for harms might come from. So again, I'll, I'll define everything a little bit more, but just on why this is so hard and also important, and several people have alluded to different parts of this already, but, you know, in this tangled mess, um, you know, sort of who is making choices about uh, what the thing we're trying to represent, uh, how it gets encoded, who gets affected, how we can sort of contest those results. All this um, really obscures different sources of power. Um, assumptions are really very often implicit. They're just, you know, not even, not even worth documenting. Um, there are strong feedback loops, which I'll talk about, um, ways we can use this to think about uh, feedback loops sort of within and across systems. Uh, we also understand that these are sort of not simply technical, not simply social, not simply organizational problems, but really in a non-separable way, um, these all interact with each other in really important ways. Um, and sort of fundamentally something that we'll return to is that how what we measure changes what we think we understand about that measurement, about the sort of the problem at hand, where harms come from. And so just a quick note on context, I guess I'm coming from my PhD in computer science, but I work heavily with uh, social scientists. Um, and uh, there are these two sort of newish fields of computational social science and fairness, accountability, transparency, and socio-technical systems. I would argue there's very significant overlap there where we're thinking about um, these large scale social structures and trying to understand um, social processes in, again, what I'm calling socio-technical systems where we really can't completely separate something being sort of a purely technical abstract in its own system from the social context in which it's implemented, embedded, assumptions are made and so on. So that's sort of where we came to this work. So I wanna first, um, talk about, you know, sort of untangling this mess, um, bring in some language from uh, the social sciences. Um, so some of this language will seem familiar, but again, because often this is not explicit, we have to sort of unravel what has happened in our systems. It's really important to be able to be precise about what we mean. So, So we might care basically almost everything interesting we care about. So if we're trying to determine who to give a loan to or um, who to kick off a platform for their toxic language to, or how we incentivize a, um, you know, people to stay in their Facebook group, what counts as pro-social behavior, uh, 
what counts as fair. Um, these are all um, examples of unobservable theoretical constructs. Um, and that's just true, but you know, we've measured them anyways. Um, but so to do so, we uh, to measure these unobservable constructs, we operationalize these constructs with a measurement model. And so I'll, I'll sort of walk through some examples of what this looks like. But this is crucial because, again, this is happening whether we acknowledge it or not. These are things that we have operationalized and use in practice. And uh, this is extra <laughs> crucial because, again, whether we acknowledge it or not, this encodes our social, organizational, cultural, political values. So um, we can't just sort of be the remove just an engineer because these are sort of necessarily happening and nested. So as I said, we have some kind of unobservable theoretical construct. Um, from that, we take the operationalization. From that, we get to observe these measurements. I've already asserted that the fairness-related harms really do emerge from mismatches within this process. Um, and that specifically construct reliability and validity help us interrogate what's going on here. So this will be something generative. So let me first give you some examples with some mismatches in the process um, and then highlight what tools we have to break this apart and then um, sort of show where this takes us. All right, so sometimes <laughs> we think about this as sort of a silly example, um, but I wanna first talk about height. So if you'll bear with me to treat height as some kind of unobservable theoretical construct, um, uh, at face value, this might seem like actually a really simple, what we might call a sort of a representational measurement. It could be represented by, you know, with respect to other um, physical objects. But maybe if I'm actually talking about people, I might say, okay, I'm talking about sort of the height of a person. That's unobservable theoretical construct. I'm going to assert that that's, I'm operationalizing this with my latent variable H, and I'll take sort of measurements using a ruler um, of what that looks like. Uh, so, we might generally agree on that. Um, however, there might be some things actually when I talk about the height of a person that um, maybe might matter depending on the context I'm using this in. Um, we talk about babies in terms of length. And if you sort of primarily use a wheelchair, I might mean something else by, <laughs> by your height. And so when I'm sort of making decisions based on height, I might use that. Um, we can also use this to think about where, for instance, um, uh, measurement error potentially associated with certain kinds of sensitive attributes. We can already think of examples of disability, but you can think about um, even processes of data collection. Um, so in the social psychology literature, there's a nice example of, you know, it would, might be one thing if I sort of ask us all to measure ourselves with rulers. Um, if instead I use data from an online dating site with self-reported height, um, what you'll end up finding is uh, systematically biased data where um, we observe that men over-report their height on average. And so what we get is something that's like correlated with this you know, sensitive variable, but uh, sort of emerged in this kind of neutral way. So um, anyways, by articulating these assumptions, we get we start to get sort of the language to pick apart where we think these things might be coming from. And so when I say height, do I actually mean, you know, sort of who am I including? Uh, is that relevant for this context? Can I understand what's going on? So that's one. Um, I'll, this is a running example in our paper, but I'll use it a little bit less um, since Reddit gave a beautiful talk yesterday um, trying to think about uh, poverty and what you get between, in her case, she was talking about uh, operationalizing poverty with income. And here I'll talk about socioeconomic status, which is, I mean, to sort of be, a, is a common um, construct in the social sciences, basically thinking about sort of position and opportunity. Uh, and so here we'll use a common operationalization, which is income. Uh, and then I'll take measurements of income. We could also call income as a proxy for SES. Proxies are just measurement models. Um, and of course, income itself has to be measured and so on. Uh, so this might be great. This might sort of seem reasonable. I might run into trouble if I'm, say, ignoring the impact of wealth. Again, if we're sort of concerned about downstream incomes or who's sort of precarious or likely to need a certain type of benefits, perhaps my income will 
report that I appear to have a sort of huge influx this month, and maybe that means every month that's true, but maybe that's actually my my payment for the six month project. Uh, so this helps us think about what we might be missing in what we are trying to get out with um, SES and health, or sorry, um, with SES and income. We can also think about downstream uh, effects. So I might try to ask questions about the relationship between SES and health. And in general, income might be a good proxy. Maybe here in Ann Arbor, where there are lots of college students who might report having a lower income but have great access to health care, uh, maybe that would actually sort of not be the right um, model there. Uh, and then finally, we can also get at other sort of data issues. Um, uh, for example, in the UK, uh, Human Rights Watch reported on a um, benefit system that used income to uh, look at whether or not you're eligible to enroll for certain benefits. Um, however, basically based on what day of the month you were paid, uh, it would estimate your uh, income, annual income differently, which meant that if you enrolled on a Monday versus a Wednesday, you might sort of qualify or not, um, which is really not the kind of what I'll call reliability that we're, we want to um, ensure. Um, and then just two more quick examples. Um, there's a classic example of um, teacher effectiveness, um, the education value added assessment model um, in the United States that's been used to uh, evaluate teachers, fire teachers. Um, and if we trust that, you know, the differences within subject for a group of students within one year divided by the fraction that that's teacher um, with a few other uh, limitations, that is the entire uh, full assessment of the quality of a teacher. We're going to make sort of very different assessments as opposed to teacher evaluations, how they relate to the class, who's in the class, what kinds of needs are in that class. Perhaps we're looking for something else. And then um, I want to highlight this work particularly by uh, Overmeyer et al, um, where they found they're looking at a um, auditing a healthcare uh, management program, or rather a uh, computational system to determine uh, who should be enrolled in such a program. Um, and so there, what is actually happening is this program is trying to decide who would have the most patient benefit from this enrollment. This is operationalized as some latent variable P, um, which is sort of this idea of future care needs is patient benefit. And that's represented as future care costs. And this is actually learned using models based on past care costs. And so what you find there is um, because past care costs are being used to represent effectively past care needs, those who have um, systematically less access to healthcare will appear to have lower costs. And so what this um, results in is um, uh, black patients being sort of systematically excluded from from these kinds of systems. So um, again, this can sort of seem nice and productive and obvious, maybe even coming in this direction once we untangle what's going on, but we need to be able to lay this out in order to understand. And just to sort of show that we do have some tools to, you know, it's all easy for me to, uh, in retrospect, come up with these stories, um, but I do wanna say that you know, this is something that is um, specifically generative. And so um, uh, I'm going to mention sort of construct reliability and validity to help identify where these assumptions are happening when we're thinking about the kinds of computational systems that we are worried about harms emerging from um, and how we can use this to both understand things that have already happened and use this as a way, as sort of a framework to think about um, what could happen in the future. and this sort of generative point I think is important because it's not just um, sort of a, a closed checklist in some format that here we actually have sort of a set of thinking tools. And so I'm going to introduce some language, but really it's about here are the types of questions you get to do to investigate sort of what's going on in the system to try and sort of, again, diagnose, mitigate, prevent various related harms. So first, um, 
again, I won't spend too much time on this. There's, uh, we have a paper on this, we have a tutorial on this, there's a video of this. We can, you can see we go into depth about all of this elsewhere. Um, but one notion is just on construct reliability, which um, in our case looks analogous to precision statistics, which might um, look something like, again, if I, you know, if I enrolled on a Monday or on a Wednesday, I would assume the same thing to happen for my uh, benefits. Um, this is actually a common task in computer science under the umbrella of uh, out of sample prediction, which is really just sort of if I ran it again on the same kind of data, do so I get the same kind of answer. Um, construct validity is something that here we're actually um, pulling from a bunch of different traditions um, from political science, uh, education testing, um, especially education testing and psychology um, for the fairness, accountability, transparency, and machine learning community specifically. Um, and so I won't go into the sort of the um, types of validity we put underneath the umbrella of construct validity. Uh, and, you know, I will say we have, we end up with these seven types. Um, I will say, you know, to some degree, or rather, no, I will say fully, I don't actually care if you use these precise labels. This isn't about, can you name, oh, it's this type of bias or this type of bias or this type of validity or this type of validity necessarily. What I primarily care about is, can you show these different types of evidence for what you're doing? Does it work? Does it work well? Um, are we able to identify the kinds of mismatches? What kinds of evidence are we able to show that sort of we're doing what we think we're doing? Um, and so, and that's really non-trivial. And so basically this, what this provides is here are sort of the sets of questions I can ask to try to get at like, okay, does it seem sort of reasonable? Eh, it has base validity. Okay, what do I actually think about what this construct means? What am I representing? Can it be represented? Does this match what I think it does? Content validity and so on. Um, so this really, again, just gives us a, a sort of a generative way to sort of break down. If we were to look back at our examples of, okay, we have this healthcare system, what's going on? We could use this to sort of unpack, okay, we're trying to think about patient benefit. Okay, we're thinking about patient costs, what's going into that, what's missing, what's outside of the model I would wanna pay attention to, and so on. And you may have already noticed there's one of these that looks sort of different. Um, and that's consequential validity. And that has a sort of strong normative sounding name. Uh, and I really want to spend some time at it because it's, it is sort of different. It was sort of brought into the validity world separately. Um, and this includes a bunch of different uh, types of ways of thinking about these kinds of feedback. So um, uh, several of us have already mentioned Goodhart's law and Campbell's law, this includes ideas like when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a useful measure. Um, washback includes ideas like teaching to the test. Um, you know, if I know that I'll be a value based on how well my students do on the test, then I'm going to, you know, emphasize that rather than maybe something I think is important otherwise. Um, this shows up in economics and through the Lucas critique, it's a lot across the social sciences as performativity of where basically the thing that we are defining then changes the system we are interacting with. Um, and I really like this quote from David Hand who writes a lot about measurement, where he says that measurements both reflect structure in the natural world and impose structure upon it. Um, and I think that's really important for our setting, especially in uh, these sort of uh, machine learning or technical settings where uh, we're often concerned about um, sort of these uh, say categories getting encoded into systems and there's an appearance of objectivity. There's an appearance of just, you know, this is just how things are, th how things are implemented. This is just sort of a, a bar you need to pass through in order to move forward. So um, I'll spend a little more time on this because I think this is a really powerful way to um, start to think about these consequences. And I'll say uh, why from, the educational testing literature from Samuel Messick, why this is argued to be part of construct validity itself and not a separate downstream thing is again that the fact that what we measure changes what we understand about that measure. We are changing the meaning and how that is interpreted by doing this. Um, 
this really then <laughs> means because we are changing the system that we are sort of bringing this measurement within, it means we have to consider that in its initial sort of, can we assert that this is, is valid, you know, when the, when the measure becomes a target and so on. So pivoting slightly, I just want to use this framing to talk a little bit about fairness, touching on some of the discussions from uh, the past two days. Um, uh, Ruben's talk was a sort of a full talk about um, egalitarian justice and that um, construct itself and its substantive nature. Um, and in general, when we're thinking about fairness itself an unobservable theoretical construct, um, especially a weird kind of unobservable theoretical construct about which there have been millennia of disagreement about what it means. Um, it is essentially contested in that it doesn't have one true shared meaning. It, it might be context specific, culture specific, time, person, context specific. Um, so we're never going to have sort of one agreed upon definition, but in different kinds of contexts, we're going to say, we are calling this fair. Um, this could be a problem if when you say fair, you mean this, and I mean something else. That might be as kind of mismatch in our theoretical understandings. Also, thinking about consequences, if you are telling me that this is a fair hiring algorithm, then to me, that sounds like you're offering me a fair hiring algorithm. Um, so when we call these things, say, fair ML, you know, we really have, you know, th that's a really strong label. Uh, so we really have to pay attention to and be wary of sort of how we use these labels as well. Um, so uh, again, this is not unique to sort of, um, fairness in itself, but here, you know, we might be concerned about notions of justice instead. Um, many of the sort of disagreements in the literature about uh, what's already been mentioned to kind of individual versus group fairness. Um, Often this is held at sort of the operationalization level of, you know, I'm measuring predictive parity or, or whatever. Um, but often the sort of underlying argument is really about uh, differences in um, what the underlying values between different types of fairness are. Um, you know, do I care about sort of the individual or the group and the logics behind that? And so if we hold the disagreement at the level of operationalizations, we sort of are obscuring the values that we're actually arguing about. It makes it much harder to disentangle when something has gone wrong. Um, individual fairness is sometimes mentioned uh, as an alternative to group fairness. Um, this is the idea of effectively like treating, you know, someone who is similar to you in a similar way. Um, I would argue that this requires knowing a lot about individuals perhaps uh, more than we could ever know about sort of the individual experience and how that maps to another, whether that's, you know, my true employee quality or my just difference from someone else, what we would each get from being treated in a certain way. And so that kind of um, sort of assumed richness of that kind of observation is a really important challenge to thinking about sort of what it would mean to implement this or, or use it and again, sort of treat it as fair without without question. And so um, uh, often we like to sort of say, assume we have the perfect measure of similarity, quality, et cetera, um, but you're throwing away a lot of the uh, assumptions in the process. Uh, group fairness itself also has problems where you have different ways to operationalize this, as others have mentioned here today, um, reflecting different theoretical understandings. Um, I'll, I'll defer to some of the political uh, theorists and legal scholars on uh, many of these points. I just want to sort of make clear how these um, conversations connect. Uh, and then also, of course, we know that group fairness um, might depend on sort of putting people in different demographic buckets um, themselves into buckets that are themselves often essentially contested, um, extremely sort of um, uh, socially constituted in a way that means that uh, when we sort of assign someone to um, a particular label, we are then potentially uh, doing something to that person. We are potentially uh, creating harms that go along with inferring or assigning and creating these groups. Um, and that when we say implement something as say, 
my system requires that I check the box M or F in order to create an account for something, I have somehow built in a sort of a mandatory gender box for anyone who wants to use the system. And so um, we're really, in a way that might seem subtle, uh, building in all of these very strong assumptions, these measurements, measurements all the way down. <laughs> so um, I already mentioned this, but I just want to uh, be clear that, you know, fairness itself, you know, we're not going to solve this one. Um, it's essentially contested. Um, but to the degree to which we are still choosing to claim that things are fair, we just need to be explicit about sort of what we are operationalizing, what the underlying values are, what we actually mean, and where and how it applies. And so that itself isn't um, necessarily <laughs> controversial, but it does mean, you know, we are making these significant decisions when we're making these choices. And so we just need to be clear about um, which disagreements are at, say, the operationalization level versus what values we're actually trying to um, reconcile. And so uh, taking this as a way to understand, really sort of bridge a lot of the talk that we've seen already, thinking about measurement helps us think about uh, how we understand harms and what we're actually trying to get at here. Um, uh, Blodgett et al. is a really wonderful paper looking at um, uh, natural language processing uh, examples specifically, but where um, effectively uh, debiasing uh, doesn't necessarily address the types of harms that we're actually interested in um, by actually sort of bringing to light the values being decided and how these systems are implemented. This actually helps us think about actually what our organizational or legal or procedural kinds of interventions as well as technical interventions. Uh, again, in our tangled mess, uh, this helps us change what questions are getting asked, uh, helps us understand where decisions are being made. And so uh, I'm not the only one to uh, be enthusiastic about this. Um, I, this went viral and I, I, I loved it um, about how uh, when you measure, include the measurer, that this is, you know, this is a sort of a social process and that we don't have our sort of like scientists and engineers making uh, non-normative decisions that we actually have these larger processes at play. And so just zooming out on um, consequential validity, uh, you know, we're really dealing with these highly durable um, social structures, which um, adapt and uh, unfortunately get obscured by these sort of technical governance decisions where we just have, again, our MRF checkbox that we needed to get into the system and so on. Um, and that, you know, this idea that we have these um, constituted and constitutive uh, um, constructs is really not unique um, to this, that we actually have a great deal of scholarship thinking about, for instance, how uh, race itself is a technology and how it um, uh, gets sort of created and encoded and reinforced in, in certain ways, different contexts. This happens with, um, anyways, we have a significant literature across the science and technology studies, sociology, and, and beyond to think about how we understand these. Um, socially constituted nature of things being measured. But this means we're still thinking about consequent validity in that, again, we, when we are sort of assigning, say, people to a group in a certain way, um, and that becomes how the group is defined. This is, um, again, sort of within this larger feedback system of measurement. And so why does it sound like I'm being pedantic about this? Um, I would argue that it, it matters because we, we need this language in order to unpack what's going on in these kinds of systems. We don't get to live in the sort of clean social science linear world. Um, measurement is everywhere, uh, basically everything we're doing and care about um, and the harms that we are most concerned with and why we're here today are the ones that emerge from mismatches in the measurement process. Uh, we do have tools from construct reliability validity to help us interrogate those. Um, you know, 
taking the full version of this quote, you know, language is power, life and the instrument of culture, the instrument of domination, liberation, you know, consequential validity is one lens that lets us bring in this sort of systems level feedback um, and helps us reconcile these different understandings of risk systems and social structure. Um, so I know I have two minutes, so I'll uh, just skip most of my last slides. Um, but I just want to mention that, you know, there are lots of ways that we can use this to um, try to make progress. Some of this work I'm doing is thinking about how we can think about risk and harms, um, uh, where again, sort of things that we might think of as AI accidents are actually um, glitches that reveal some kind of underlying social structure. Uh, this really sort of points to a need for these kinds of structural explanations, um, but places where we can learn from other types of um, settings that have already been concerned about these organizational, cultural, um, technical settings where the issue is not risk necessarily, but power. Um, a cool project I can talk about offline is um, on the uh, Havana Street Net, which is again sort of trying to bridge the individual and system level um, type of setting. Uh, what's fun about this is, you know, this is a, a sort of uh, we can sort of physically see the wires between apartments and it really uh, highlights the kind of sort of social, organizational, political processes going on that underlie this sort of important infrastructure. And really broadly, this is sort of always happening. It's not usually so explicit, but when we study this, we can see how, depending on which levels we're looking at, we really sort of change our understanding of how, for example, inequality gets encoded in this kind of system. And so really by uh, being able to look at sort of case studies like this, we can really sort of think about frameworks for understanding um, processes that happen both at the individual and system level. So those are just some fun things I'm thinking about. Um, you know, measurement is everywhere. I think this is just you know, something we need to keep in mind um, as we're thinking about how we understand risk and systems and social structure and, and bridging across these sort of social and um, technical fields. So I'm at time. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eddie. Who wants to ask questions? Ruben. Uh Thanks. Thanks for a really, really great talk. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in this, in the, the idea of applying construct validity to, to solve problems of fairness. And I, I wonder if um, one of the reasons why it's, it feels kind of like it's going to result in, I don't know how, how to put this, but it, it rubs up against the ways that uh, the deployment of ML in practice wants to be a science, but it is a political compromise. So I guess so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, so the, the psychologists who invented this notion of construct validity were were, con, were kind of concerned with uh, are the things we're measuring what we need, mean to measure, and can we compare between different experiments to be sure that we're measuring the same thing? Um, whereas the constructs that are being used in ML systems to do things like uh, you know, allocate jobs. The the construct might be something like merit, which is which is not a, a kind of a, a component in a theory that psychologists are trying to discover. But it's a it's a, it's like a compromise that has been built up over many years that obscures many political uh, questions which people would rather not deal with. Um, is is does that kind of raise a challenge to the use of construct validity as a means of of addressing fairness issues in practice? Yeah, that's a great question. And in some ways, um, the answer sort of depends on the audience. And so, uh, you know, this is not the version of the talk that I necessarily give to all social scientists who say like, yeah, of course, like, con sure, whatever, constructs. Um, with computer scientists, which is sort of much more the sort of audience we're in intervening upon, um, it's a way of uh, unpacking these social, et cetera, political processes that are underlying the things that are already being done. And so in this work, we do a lot, we sort of spend a lot of time unpacking individual examples of like, you know, uh, 
you know, like, let's look at the system, what assumptions are being made, how do we understand it? Really, it's just about being a good computer scientist to do this model well. Um, and, you know, here's how we uh, can unpack what's going on in a way that, you know, just we're, just helps us sort of unpack what those assumptions are uh, in a way that is not, again, sort of, it's not just sort of like a fixed checklist, but is in a way that's sort of participatory and generative. Um, so uh, I would say we're trying to use it to as a point of entry <laughs> to allow for acknowledging some of those assumptions, um, especially because uh, contract validity you sort of you don't necessarily need the sort of fully um, theoretically motivated construct in order to to get there. In some ways, it, it's also fine if you're sort of starting with like, here's what I'm asserting this construct is. And now given that assumption, here are the assumptions I'm making on how that's represented. So, but yeah, I think that's a, a core, a great point. <laughs> so. Great, great. Jeremiah? Thank you so much for a brilliant yeah. talk, Abby. Um, and uh, Ruben's just stick the first of my two questions. Um, <laughs> because that's something I've also found bizarre that particularly in the employment context, you know, you'll have software promising to identify your most innovative employees and, and, and all that sort of rubbish. Um, and a slightly related point is, to what extent does context specificity come in? Because so another sort of measurement that we see a lot in the employment context is productivity, right? And so you get your weekly email or daily email from Microsoft Teams giving you your feedback on how productive you were today. And I can see that in certain professions that can actually you know, be a genuine measurement, right? If I'm in a call center and, you know, customer services, then maybe how many keystrokes I've done, how many calls I've taken is actually a measurement of my productivity. Whereas I guess for us academics, it might be the exact opposite, right? I mean, the, the moment I switch on my computer and do anything on MS Teams or email, my productivity drops to zero. And it's only when I've switched everything off that I'm being productive. So is there space for sort of context specificity as well in there? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, and also I, I personally, have thought a lot about these sort of organizational productivity measures as not meaning a lot in certain contexts. So also with you there. Um, but uh, I think where we think about context is gets into sort of how we might evaluate it in terms of, you know, sort of all of these evaluations are like, yeah, maybe this like measure of height doesn't matter in this kind of setting. But if I'm like deploying this in this kind of setting, does this better? Does this still work? Um, so sometimes this goes under the umbrella of like external validity, which for us I, um, falls partly in content validity for us. Um, so yeah, I think sort of the fact that all of this ends up being about how like context matters and like who you're actually imagining using this and what the impacts are and if it applies is sort of, I think that's sort of the whole need of it. <laughs> so definitely. Brilliant, thank you. Max? Um, so yeah, very interesting talk. So I guess when, when I talk to, to people in CS, machine learning in industry, I feel like you often get this attitude that, oh, the problem is just the data and we are fine, right? So like there's, there's nothing wrong about the social impact of, of AI and the deployment of these technologies. I guess my counter reaction would be like, even if you perfectly measure what you want to measure, and even if you perfectly predict everything without error, I think there are still a lot of issues in particular, I guess, related to inequality, for instance. If you take the productivity example, then I know, the productivity as in your contribution to the profit of the firm. Um, we, even like by improving prediction measurement, we might actually increase inequalities. And so I guess I was wondering how you think of your work relative to, to this attitude of engineers. Yeah, I mean, so it's relevant that, um, again, like my PhD is in computer science, a lot of this work came out of being at machine learning conferences and having these kinds of conversations um, where uh, we, we, I mean, we are sort of trained to think that a lot of these pieces are really, you know, like modular and can be like addressed separately and often have technical solutions and um, uh, and, uh, oh, there was a talk yesterday that, anyways, several of the talks yesterday really sort of um, bridged this well with thinking about um, where different types of, um, you know, even if we are more precisely targeted, you know, this can actually increase inequality, we get to um, sort of see these impacts uh, throughout. So that's a bit of a ramble. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think because partly there is this like, 
want to um, have technical solutions. There is a want to separate out the pure engineering of it. Um, I think it's important to, again, sort of similarly <laughs> to what I said before, like to sort of bring in like where assumptions are being made and how we think about sort of like the systems level consequences. Um, part of the work I didn't really have time to mention was um, where we're looking at other high risk kinds of settings where, you know, if you're trying to not have your naval submarine get into trouble, um, it's understood that it's not just a technical problem, but it's also like an organizational and cultural uh, problem as well. And so settings where, you know, we can learn from, you know, uh, how we understand sort of problems and systems, I think, can be valuable also in terms of, in some ways, just sort of like normalizing uh, that these aren't independent systems. So that's a non-answer. Okay. <laughs> right, let's take one last 10 minute break and then we will conclude the conference with Mustafa's talk. So please everybody stick around and thanks everyone.